we've all had the experience of having nightmares, where every option seems, seems horrible, and very few options at all. And then suddenly remember, you're dreaming, and it gets you out. That's the way in which the Dharma functions as a refuge. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. We talked about how taking refuge in the Buddha means following his qualities or developing his qualities, taking him as an example in terms of wisdom, compassion, purity. The same with the Sangha. You take the Sangha as an example. They practice well. They practice straightforwardly. For the sake of knowledge, they practice masterfully. You think about their example, and it gives you inspiration. What about the Dharma? The Dharma is not a person that you can emulate, but it's something you remember. In fact, that's one of the meanings of the word Dhamma, something to be remembered. And when the Buddha talks about taking the Dharma as a refuge, he specifically talks about developing the, f the four establishings of mindfulness. In other words, developing your powers of memory so they're useful on the path, providing you with the right framework for looking at states of mind. So when you get in a bad state of mind, and it seems to settle in, and it, everything around you confirms that yes, what you're thinking is, is true, that things are miserable, or you're miserable, or the world is conspiring against you, or your body is conspiring against you. Remembering the, the right frame of reference helps pull you out. Remember, this is a state of becoming that you've got yourself in. And what does the Buddha say about states of becoming? They're skillful and unskillful ones. That's what the establishings of mindless, mindfulness are for, is to look at your mind states in a, let, in a more impersonal way, step back from them, and ask yourself, if this mind state were in somebody else's mind, what would you recommend that they do? Especially knowing what the Buddhist teachings about what we should do with unskillful states, how to abandon them, how to take them apart, how to take apart the suffering that goes with them. You notice when the Buddha talks about suffering or stress, he starts out with lots of examples that we can identify with in the narratives of our lives. Illness, aging, death, it's being separated from those you love, having to stay with those you don't like at all, not getting what you want. We can all have lots of stories about those things. But then he points out what's common to all of those things, common to all the suffering and all, and all those things, is the five clinging aggregates. Now those are not personal things. When you think about your thoughts or your mind states in terms of aggregates, it pulls you out. You see the mind state as an activity, and there's a feeling that's going into it, and there's a way of breathing that goes into it, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. Seeing things in those terms helps pull you out. And so there's the alertness to remind yourself, okay, this is a mind state. That puts it in a framework. And then remembering what kind of mind state it is to recognize what mind state it is. And then remembering what should be done with that kind of mind state. And then there's ardency. You really do want to get out of it. And this is sometimes where you run against a part of the mind that likes to stay, and likes to stew around in its juices. You have to take that apart as well. What kind of mind state is that? Why would you identify with it? So when you learn to see these mind states in impersonal terms, see your moods in impersonal terms. That's how the Dharma becomes your refuge, because it gives you advice on what to do. Those lists of mind states under the third 
frame of reference. They're not just there for you to notice, oh, there's this mind state, there's that mind state, we're going to watch it come and go. They're skillful and unskillful mind states. And the skillful ones are being developed. The unskillful ones are to be abandoned. And they're unsee theirs. Because it's the same thing as right effort it means learning how to motivate yourself to want to abandon the unskillful state rather than just wallowing around in it or being a slave to it. Seeing yourself being enslaved, that's one way of getting a perspective on it. Our thoughts are there for us to use. They should be our tools. We should be the masters of the tools. But it's almost as if the tools take on a life of their own. It's some sort of bewitched workshop where the tools turn on the on the carpenter. Like those twilights of that twilight zone. Showing which the all the machines and things in the house, all the appliances in the house conspire to kill the owner. Watch out that your thoughts don't kill you, that they don't conspire against you. Learn how to step out of them. It's when you step out of them that they lose their power. As long as you're in the state of becoming, created by those thoughts, and you see everything in the world in line with that state of becoming, that's when they can turn on you. So learn how to step out. Remember no, that no matter how real a state of becoming may seem, It's not the true story. It's a state of mind based on a desire. And sometimes the desire is hard to ferret out because the mind state becomes so negative. You can ask yourself, what kind of desire could have started this mind state? Well, it's a desire that's gotten thwarted. So learn to look for that. So that even though this seems very real, and you know that when you're here, you're not in a dream. Remind yourself, your mind state has a lot of dreamlike qualities, and one of which is that it can really distort the way things are. And when you're in, as when, when you're in a dream, everything seems so real. The same way, when you're in a negative mind state, it seems to have the real take on everything. But there are other ways of looking at it. And the best way to get out of it is to see it simply as an act. It's a type of karma, and it's unskillful. It's something to be abandoned. And if you can remember that, if you've worked on the establishings of mindfulness long enough so that you're good at pulling yourself out of distractions while you're meditating, well, then you can use the same skill to pull yourself out of a negative mood, no matter how long and deeply entrenched the mood may be. Remember in John Sawat's example, he says, when insight arises, it's like a light taken into the darkness. And no matter how long that place has been dark, the darkness can't say to the light, you have no right to come in here. We've been here for a long, long time, and you're brand new. As soon as the light comes, it can chase the darkness away, no matter how long it's been there. In the same way, the Dharma as a refuge can chase away a lot of your bad moods, no matter how deeply entrenched they may seem. Just so remember that it's in your powers of memory, your remembrance of the Dharma. That's where your refuge is going to be. In fact, that's what enables you to take the Buddha and the Sangha as a refuge, because you forget about them, and that's all too often what happens. You get in a mind state, and it's as if the Buddha never existed, the Great Ajahn's never existed, it's just you and your mind state. But if you can remember them, you remember the Dharma that they practiced, that can help pull you out and take you to safety.